After a bitter campaign, a high turnout and a tight result, which way forward now for Poland? Hello, everyone. I'm François Picard. Welcome to the France 24 debate. Yeah, with nearly all the vote ballots that are now counted, conservative incumbent Andrzej Duda edging centrist challenger Rafał Chaskowski in a win that enables the ruling Law and Justice Party to pursue an overhaul of the judiciary, which the European Union says f falls short of uh, the standard of member states on protecting rule of law. With such a narrow win, what kind of a mandate for Duda and his ruling peace party? We'll break down the growing divide between urban areas that have thrived since Poland joined the EU in 2004 and a Catholic conservative periphery that has uh, viewed this campaign as a, quote, civilizational battle. Candidate Duda at one point even branding gay rights an ideology, one that was more destructive than communism. For the opposition, it's another in a string of losses, but it was closer this time, and the centrists can take heart in the strong show by Chaskovsky and the former mayor of Warsaw. They believe they finally found an opposition leader who can break the ruling pieces uh, lock on power since 2015. Today in the France 24 debate, we're asking which way forward for Poland. Uh, joining us uh, from Warsaw, Bartolomey Roblewski, member of uh, the lower house of parliament for the ruling Law and Justice Party. Welcome to the show. Hello. And, and, and congratulations. We also want to welcome uh, Marcin Zaborowski, editor-in-chief of Respublika Nova magazine and lecturer at Lazarski University. Welcome back to the show. Thank you for having me. From uh, the uh, Belgian capital, Brussels, from the European capital, Dominika Kozic, who's correspondent for uh, pub Polish uh, public broadcaster TVP. Thanks for being hello, with us, Dominika. Fran hello, Fran hello, everybody. And uh, from Cambridge in England, Stanley Bell, senior lecturer in Polish studies at uh, the University of Cambridge. Thanks for joining us. Thank you. The France 24 debate, where you can join the conversation on Facebook and on Twitter. The hashtag is F24Debate. Yeah, as we record, uh, the final ballots are being counted. The margin is uh, wide enough uh, so that we are certain that Andrzej Duda has won a second five-year uh, term. Turnout, uh, a very high. Uh, one of the highest since uh, Poland uh, reverted to democracy. More from Shirley Sitbon. The final votes were counted on Monday morning, showing President Andrzej Duda was re-elected. But the conservative leader had already celebrated his victory the night before, when pollsters said results were too close to call. Thank you all from the bottom of my heart. Winning the presidential election with 70% turnout is incredible news. I'm extremely touched. Thank you all from the bottom of my heart. Duda's rival, Rafał Czaskowski, missed his target. Orsa's liberal mayor had hoped people who voted for other parties in the first round would have turned to him. Duda benefited from rural, religious, conservative voters. Now, he and his ally, the Law and Justice Party, are expected to pursue their conservative agenda, continuing their controversial judiciary reform. It will uh, continue its uh, changes, legal changes to the judicial system, ensuring that the uh, justice system is much more subject, uh, subject to, the, to the will of, of power uh, coming from the uh, executive. The country is now deeply divided between the East, where President Duda prevailed on vows to limit abortion rights, to amend the Constitution, to ban LGBT adoptions while promising to boost social benefits. Meanwhile, the West voted for the anti-Duda candidate, Rafał Czaskowski, who backed civil unions for homosexuals, although not adoptions. He also wanted to improve Poland's fraught ties with the European Union. So the result is tight. Uh, let me begin with you, uh, Bartholomew uh, Robertski. How much of a mandate is this vote? I mean, there is no big change between this election and election five years ago in this sense that uh, the results are more or less the same. 51.3.5 
for uh, Andrzej Duda and uh, 48.5.7 for uh, opposition candidate for Rafał Czaskowski. And uh, if we look um, at the results of the elections uh, 10 years ago, 15 years ago, the story, the story is more or less the same. I mean, uh, always the country is divided in two parts and they are more or less uh, similar. There is always a difference, but it's not a big difference. So I think the mandate is the same as five years ago, uh, ten years ago, when Mr. Uh, Bronisław Komorowski, President Bronisław Komorowski, won, ele won the election and before. So I, I don't see any big uh, difference as the, as the. Um, uh, uh, as the position of the president, uh, as as his mandate, Marcin Zaborowski. Just a reminder again: uh, the 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 Poland's uh, pr president is mostly an arbiter. He's not the one who formulates policy as such. Do you agree with uh, that? This isn't a big change. No, I mean, I, I partially agree, but uh, indeed, you know, the country is divided, and uh, certainly the. Uh, the result itself is not like massively different to what was five years ago. But, you know, five years ago, uh, when Duda was elected for the first time, we had a, a, a different different political setup. Uh, he was elected in the condition where the liberal forces were still in the government. Uh, and the election of uh, Andrzej Duda was the first sign of, a, you know, the fatigue and people wanting a change. So people had, since then, this change for the period of five years. It started with the election of Duda, then Law and Justice was elected, then it was re-elected. So we have had this domination of Law and Justice in Polish politics since. And I think that, um, you know, in the course of these five years, Law and Justice quite effectively uh, divided and, uh, you know, opposition and the opposition itself, you know, uh, got weakened uh, and uh, it, it was it was in a dire position only a few months ago. Uh, you know, according to to opinion polls, about a month or a month and a half ago, Andrzej Duda would have won in the first round uh, and would have won in a with a big margin. And then you know uh, there was a change. Rafał Trzaskowski is joining the race, and after he joined the race, the opposition got galvanized, uh, and uh, obviously he. He didn't win, but he was very close to winning to, well, to getting there. He ran out of time. Also, let's mention here that he had half of the resources of the, of the contender, of the, of the incumbent, and also the state-owned television was all the time, you know, pumping up the messaging in favor of, uh, of the incumbent president. So the chances were not quite equal here, and still Rafał Czaskowski, well, got 48 and half percent so which I, I think should be a warning sign for law and justice that a uh, opposition is getting mobilized and the big part of the country is is tired of, of the government of law and justice Dominika Kozic, uh, your uh, your television station TVP you commissioned an exit poll which found that there's this real sharp divide young people uh, voting more for the opposition compared to older people, and also uh, people in the countryside voting 63%, nearly two-thirds for the ruling uh, Law and Justice Party, whereas in towns it was, uh, well, the mirror effect uh, uh, for the opposition. Is time on the opposition side? Yes, but uh, from the other side, when you look on the composition of Polish society, you see that the uh, 60% of Polish citizens live in countryside, in smaller villages and smaller towns. Those people from bigger towns, it's only around the maximum 10 million Polish citizens. So it is a result. It is my side. And second question, it is, I think that it should be kind of lesson for the government party how to deal with this, because young people who, have, who five years ago used to vote for Andrzej Duda, now they decided to vote for, uh, mostly for Rafał Trzaskowski. So I think that the uh, Green Party on Justice should start to have kind of offered 
proposal for younger people. They used to um, address their efforts uh, for the elder people, for the families, uh, like many social programs. Now they should start to think how to talk, how to communicate with younger people. I think that one of the mistakes, I, it was a few mistakes, I think, even during this campaign. One, it was, for example, a very lack of activity on the uh, internet, because uh, young people are, they are not watching TV, they are not reading newspapers. They are observing Instagram, they are uh, following uh, Facebook and other social platforms. So, and it was not enough, not enough information for them. It's, uh, it is uh, one question. And second, that uh, young people are always, uh, used to be always against government. They are more radical. They want always some change. So that's why maybe five years ago, Andrzej Duda, as a candidate of opposition, had a uh, huge support of young people. Now, as a candidate of ruling party, uh, he didn't have this support. On that score, uh, there has been some criticism of uh, the way state media handled uh, the, uh, the campaign with uh, too much coverage, uh, say, critics uh, given to the ruling party. What do you say? I would say that it is the, still the same situation with uh, public media because five years ago, public television was in the hand of a uh, uh, platform civic and uh, they used to support very strongly kind date of platform civic, Mr. Uh, Bronisław Komorowski. And now it, is, uh, it has changed, now it is in the hands of ruling party and justice. And um, I think that it is typical for Poland uh, that the public media used to support candidate of government. Uh, he's uh, or she is us usually more visible in public media. So I think it, uh, it is still the same story. Stanley, Bill, do you agree? Uh, no, not at all. Uh, there, there is no comparison in the scale of uh, bias uh, that we've seen in the public media in this campaign with previously. It is true to some extent that public media has tended to be biased towards the government, but the scale here is completely different. Um, we, we've seen essentially authoritarian style propaganda in what is still a democratic uh, country, I'm, I'm glad to say, and we saw this great uh, participation of many polls with the high turnout in these elections. But nevertheless, th th this is not the public media of a democracy. Uh, we saw a campaign that is focused on, in some cases, you know, almost a kind of Belarusian or some people even said North Korean style promotion of Andrzej Duda. There was one particular piece featuring this uh, sentimental music that would be funny if not for the uh, serious potential political consequences. To give you a sense of the way in which the opposition candidate was constantly attacked uh, on the last night before election silence, the reports that were on the evening news bulletin, those about Andrzej Duda had titles like Polish heroes support Duda. Uh, those that were on the opposition candidate, Rafał Trzaskowski, had titles like attack on Polishness and Polish symbols, or Trzaskowski's supporters are destroying Poles. And very concerningly earlier in the week and previously also, uh, a kind of dog whistle anti-Semitism. So we saw uh, headlines on the evening news which said, will Chaskovsky fulfill Jewish demands? With this very clear signal uh, to, to a kind of nationalist xenophobic uh, section potentially uh, of the electorate. So no, this is not what has happened in the past. This is very different and it uh, undeniably gives um, an, an advantage to Duda. Uh, what we see in fact, is public money, the money of all taxpayers, being used to fund the election campaign of one candidate. And that's an enormous unfair advantage. And in this case, you essentially have the newsroom as a literal extension of the uh, campaign room, uh, where the campaign team is dictating what goes on public news of an evening in response to the surveys and opinion polls, that their internal polling that they do. So you have coordinated propaganda on public money. So you heard Dominica say that, yeah. uh, I in don't agree campaign, with this. You, you heard Dominica say that in this yeah. campaign, uh, younger people especially, they mm -hmm. didn't really go to uh, to the traditional media outlets anyway. That's right. That's right. Because the aim of this is not to hit the young people or anybody in the middle. The aim of this, what's very important in elections is getting your base out to vote. Turnout is crucial. And the aim of this propaganda was to mobilize the hardcore uh, base of, cons of uh, traditional conservatives, mostly in the provinces, 
um, by getting them scared, essentially. So that's why you'd see this sort of fear mongering. And people inside the party are very aware of this. And many supporters of peace are embarrassed by this propaganda. And it's interesting, the effects, though, I, I won't be definitive about the effects because there are some people that even argue that this uh, propaganda is so repellent that it actually might have the opposite effect. There are people within peace that say this, uh, that they, they fear that the propaganda is so bad that it turns off moderates and therefore doesn't actually uh, help the party. Uh, but nevertheless, it's a change in, in quality. It's aimed at uh, older and provincial, more traditional voters, making sure they get out into the booth on election day to vote. I'll just make one final point, which is to say the only mitigating factor here, uh, and again, why I would hesitate to say that it has a decisive effect on the election, so it's certainly an advantage, is that Poland's overall media scene is pluralistic. Um, and it is true that there is a significant proportion of mainstream media who are, on the other hand, biased against uh, peace. Uh, and and some, there were media, private media, who, who were openly campaigning for the opposition candidate, uh, Shaskovsky, in fact, producing pamphlets uh, for him and distributing those for free. So that overall picture means it's not quite so clear, but the role of the public media, just in terms of what it's done to public discourse in Poland, uh, I would say, in my analysis, is very negative um, in the last five years. Bartolomeu Wolewski, let me ask you, um, we said at the outset, uh, a country that's divided, a campaign that became more bitter as it, as it wore on. Um, would you say, would you, following up from what you just heard from Stanley Bill, that uh, by energizing the base, this divide is growing larger to the point where those differences are irreconcilable between those two Polands we described? Surely not. I mean, the emotions are in Polish politics and they were five years ago, 10 years ago, 15 years ago. So divisions are something normal uh, in democracy and in Polish politics. So uh, uh, every five years uh, you can hear that divisions are bigger than five years uh, uh, ago. But uh, I think it's very exaggerated. Anti-Semitic rhetoric, though, coming back on to... I will say something more about um, uh, the situation in Polish media, because I don't think it's very right and honest. Honestly speaking, uh, I don't think uh, it describes the situation in a proper way. Well, five years ago, we had no pluralism in Polish media. And ten years ago, we had little pluralism in Polish media. I mean, um, uh, uh, um, uh, the problem of Polish democracy was that it was very unbalanced for very but, long but time. But you'll agree that oh, two wrongs we, don't we make a right. Only, we had our, we had I, our international oh, affairs oh, editor. Oh, we had oh, our international oh. affairs editor on Friday watch the state evening news bulletin. Said the first fifteen minutes were devoted to Andrzej Duda. And only then did they go to the opposition, uh, criticizing what they what they deemed attacks on the press uh, by uh, by the by the opposition candidate. Okay, but let me finish. I mean, for thirty years or twenty five years, we had the situation when three big televisions, three big uh, uh, radios, uh, belonged to one political side. To liberal uh, uh, liberal side, so in fact we had democracy without pluralism in the media. Now you can complain about public television, but for the first time, uh, maybe not for the first, but 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 uh, now we have some kind of balance. In as for big media, you have um, opposition media like uh, TVN. Uh, or uh, uh, big uh, radios uh, and internet uh, uh, internet media, they belong and they support uh, Rafał Czaskowski and liberal parties, uh, liberal uh, 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 liberal side of political life in Poland. Uh, so uh, all um, I mean this complaints about quality of public media should be seen in this context that uh, we had for a long time in Poland 
majority of Polish citizens, majority of us, uh, I can say it in my name as well, uh, we had no, uh, our voice, our convictions were not present in any media, any big media in Poland. So uh, we had, as I said, democracy without pluralism in the media. Now situ the situation is different and some people are not glad that uh, there are conservative media. But you cannot have a known as democracy without, the, without pluralism, um, uh, I mean, in the media. I, know, I, I, wanna, I, I, media wanna, I wanna bring in uh, uh, Marcin Zaborowski, do you agree? No, I, di I disagree with that. I mean, uh, uh, A, I think that, uh, uh, you know, there has always been a pluralism in, in media. It's not uh, true. Really, okay. it's not true. I mean, you, you more made decisions, more newspapers can I make my different views. I, I listen to you, sir. Uh, okay, so uh, you always had Radio Maria. Uh, well, a very like, small radio. This is one of the most popular, you know, radios in this country. No, you, not you true. Had, Ten so. times smaller than Radio Z, for example. As for uh, uh, as for the number of uh, listeners, can can we agree that I finish my point and then you know we can continue? So there has always been Radio Maria. There has been uh, the Catholic TV Fam. Uh, there has been, uh, you know, Polsat, which was always kind of in the middle, uh, and this is a main, really, uh, news outlet in this country. And, you know, the right has always had a, a big proportion of a press market. So, I mean, I do agree with what uh, Stanley B Bill said at the beginning, that, um, you know, the public TV tends to be biased towards, the, uh, towards those who are in government, but we have a very different system now. A very different system in the sense that the uh, the leadership of the public media was uh, formally was nominated and appointed by the bipartisan or multi uh, political uh, board. Uh, with law and justice coming to power, the, this board was removed, and now the appointment for the leadership of the public TV and public radio and other you know public media outlets are directly appointed by the minister. So that means that these, uh, you know, public outlets are not really public, but just, you know, one party uh, propaganda tools. Uh, and uh, it represents a big, uh, big difference to what situation used to be five years ago. All right. Uh, we, we've got a lot to get through and unfortunately a, a little amount of time. So I just want to go through some of those campaign issues that fed into this divide, if you will. Uh, and I'll, I'll, I'll begin uh, with, with you, Dominika Kozic. Um, those statement, that statement by candidate uh, Duda, um, criticizing homosexuals, saying that they're a that uh, gay rights is an ideology more destructive than communism, did that help or hurt the incumbent? I think that this uh, question of LGBT uh, issues and rights was uh, not the main issues uh, which is interesting uh, for the Polish. Uh, voters and i think that it was quite a mistake uh, to raise this question during the campaign and uh, i sh i would like to dis uh, make this difference between uh, the comments of president andrzej duda and uh, some politicians from his party some of uh, those politicians had of course uh, unacceptable uh, statement about uh, homosexuals and uh, i think that they bring uh, more problems for president than uh, than health and, uh, All right, and more, more, more broadly, Dominika, we can listen to uh, Andre Duda. This was um, uh, at a campaign rally before the first round. I just want your reaction to it. Let's first listen to, to, to the uh, uh, re-elected Polish president. Niech żyje polska rodzina, niech żyje nasza tradycja. Nie wolno nam nikomu pozwolić nam jej odebrać, nikomu. Now, seemingly a patriotic uh, statement there. Uh, is there a dog whistle message in there, though, that uh, if you don't support our values, in other words, conservative Catholic values, then you're not really Polish? No, I don't agree that uh, he told uh, literally that uh, if you are not supporting these values, you are not Polish, uh, because it, uh, it would be kind of absurd. 
But from the other side, it was a lot of rumor about uh, these issues. I think that it was completely useless because it is dividing Poland in an unnecessary way. And uh, I think that uh, Mr. it didn't help a lot uh, to president, especially for, that for the people, for the voters, there are much more interesting uh, questions like, for example, social programs like security of Poland. Then uh, this question, which is uh, which always used to be controversial in Poland, so most of the Polish uh, citizens, are, citizens are really conservative. For them, uh, this uh, traditional family it is uh, the fundament, the base of the society. Uh, they are mostly uh, practicing uh, Catholics, and they are supporting this uh, conservative traditional values. So it is uh, not that the uh, fact that the uh, president is not representing this part of uh, society, he is representing. And I think that it is not only a question of Poland, because when you look on the situation in some other, some called Eastern countries like Romania, Bulgaria, Slovakia, now you have new government in Slovakia and you see that they have even sometimes much stronger comments on these issues uh, than Polish uh, president. Much stronger than the Polish president, Stanley Bill, yes. do you agree? Well, I mean, just in, in general, I, I do agree with, uh, with Ms. Kosic's uh, comments on what issues were, that perhaps for many voters, there were more important issues than these issues that have obviously got all of the attention in the international media and that there's been a lot of focus on, and rightly so. Because I think, but I think we need to divide of two different dimensions to this victory, uh, negative ones and, and positive ones. I mean, the negative one, uh, campaign that I was talking about before to get a certain group of voters out. This is where we saw this, uh, you know, incitement really, a, 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 an incitement uh, of suspicion or concern or fear about LGBT ideology, as it's called, and the threat to children supposedly represented by gay rights campaigners. And there's a lot of language being used there, um, which, you know, has an effect on real, on real people uh, in the society. The anti-Semitic language that I talked about and then anti-German language. But I think we have to look on the other side, which is really, I think, in many respects, the foundation of the success of Duda and peace. And that is the fact that many voters in small towns and villages where Duda wins the, won the majority of the vote, genuinely feel that their lives have improved and that they are being seen and heard um, in a way that they haven't before. Uh, by by the government. Um, and that's very important to re remember that. And Duda, in the five years of his presidency, traveled all around the country continually, visited many, many of these small towns and villages, had meetings probably with hundreds of thousands or even millions of Poles, emphasizing the very popular uh, social redistribution programs that peace has introduced. And that has in fact moved the whole uh, center of Polish politics to the left in terms of economy. Even the liberal, even the liberal parties won't oppose the idea of these programs now. They say that we'll accept them, we won't take them away. That's what Shostakovsky said. And of so, course, there's another there's another factor in all of this, Stanley Bill, which yeah. is uh, this is taking place like during the, in the rest of the world, an election yeah. during a pandemic, and yeah. uh, we saw and COVID nineteen has uh, has, right. pr has particularly hard hit. Uh, Silesia, which is home to all those coal mines. Uh, I mean, on, on the pandemic, I mean, it's interesting that it didn't really have a very big effect on this campaign. Its main effect on this campaign was allowing the opposition, when the elections were, were postponed, to, to change their candidate and, uh, and, and perhaps to do better as a result, as this new candidate seemed to be a stronger one than the candidate they had before. Apart from that, it, it, was, not a major, it was not a major talking point in this campaign. And it has to be said that, on the whole, Poland uh, seems to have handled um, the the COVID-19 issue better than uh, many other countries in Europe and better than the country that I'm in uh, right now than the United Kingdom. And I think many, many voters had that general impression, even if there were concerns about certain aspects of the way it was being handled. I don't think it was a major issue in this campaign, which might sound paradoxical. Bartolomeu uh, Wroblewski, uh, what's going to be the future now going forward coming out of this pandemic? Uh, for uh, the again, that one area that's been hardest hit, that's home to all those coal mines that had to partially shut down or completely shut down for a while uh, uh, because of COVID-19. Well, nobody knows uh, what is going to happen in the next months. Uh, we hope we'll be able to handle with pandemic better 
uh, than in previous months. Uh, and we have to say that the previous months were not as bad in Poland as in many Western countries, as in Italy, in Spain, in England, or in the United States. Uh, uh, but surely, uh, I mean, it was difficult time. It is a big challenge. It was, and still, it is a big challenge for uh, for our government, for Poland. But we hope we will uh, do it. Uh, mm, uh, now we are better prepared, and uh, I think not only I can say it not only in the name of the government. But I mean, among Polish citizens, people get used to it, and I hope, uh, I hope, the worst time of uh, pandemic uh, is over. The worst of the pandemic is over, Marcin Zaborowski, or when you, because right now we're getting set for this EU summit uh, where it's going to be all about uh, what comes next, and it could be could be very difficult. Mm -hmm. Livelihoods are at stake. Well, the pandemic didn't really affect Poland to the same extent as it did affect most of other EU member states. Uh, you know, the number of infections in Poland was just a little bit over 20,000, 25,000, if I'm not mistaken. Uh, most of these people recovered. The number of deaths has been just above uh, 1,000 to 300 people. So overall mortality rate in Poland is not higher uh, at this time of the year than it was last year. So actually, you know, it, it is true that the, the the impact of the pandemic on the health situation in the country has not been that major. Um, and it's also true that in terms of economy, the impact would be less damaging than in most of the EU member states, uh, according to the, uh, you know, Commission, uh, EU Commission uh, prognosis. Uh, however, yes, uh, you know, there will be recession, there will be deeper recession than it is now. So far, law and justice has not been um, uh, dented, support for law and justice has not been dented by the worsening economic situation because it's not visible yet. But in a few months' time, uh, we, will, we, will see, uh, we will see how law and justice is, is coping with the, with the crisis, with the economic crisis, which undoubtedly is coming. And when you look, think back to this campaign and you heard uh, both Dominika Kozic uh, and uh, Stanley Bill talk about the fact that uh, the main issue wasn't those identity issues that we've been talking about, those cultural uh, culture war issues of some have, have branded them, but rather uh, bread and butter issues. You agree with that, Marcin? I, I, yes and no. I mean, I, I think culture, um, cultural issues, yes, but I would right to bring into this debate something else i think emotions were far more important for both camps emotions were far more important and negative emotions than uh than you know the assessment of economic programs you know where rafael chaskosi is going to take the country where president duda will take the country in the next five years you know people didn't really look into that stuff uh you know i think both camps were driven by uh, emotions, meaning the camp who was voting for President Duda in many respects, this is the people who didn't do so well during the transition time. So some of them are driven by emotions, by by uh, by envy. Some of them are driven by uh, you know uh, a strive for dignity. Really, they want they 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 position their situation to be recognized. And at the same time, some people who were voting for Rafał Trzaskowski we're driven by a kind of a sense of superiority. You know, we've done well. We, we're here in big cities, in big towns, you know. We are more educated. We speak languages. Uh, you know, we, we know Europe. So we, we know what's best for you. So I think that this negative emotion has, is very really important. Has, has Poland found itself an opposition leader, which it didn't seem to have a strong one ever since uh, former Prime Minister Donald Tusk left to go to Brussels? Well, we will we will see whether you know Rafał Chaskowski emerges as one of his people. Um, uh, you know, there has been a, a third candidate in this election. We didn't speak about him yet, uh, Mr. Hołownia, uh, who was a former TV anchor. Uh, so, uh, a bright future awaits you, François. 
uh, <laughs> who knows? Uh, so, uh, and Mr. Hovnia was kind of like positioning himself as a third candidate, as somebody who is between, you know, who who can combine these emotions and can bring a positive messaging. But he recognizes that some people are in the in this disadvantage, you know, position in the east of the country. But he he wants to act as a unifier, uh, and you know, he didn't make it to the third round because you know Rafał Czaskowski entered the race. But had he done so, most of opinion polls were actually predicting that he would have won in the second round. So it seems that people are tired of this kind of, you know, battle of the, uh, you know, smugness from big cities and, you know, conservative messaging from the, from the provinces. That people want somebody who can actually come and say, you know, we, we, I want to bring the country together. Uh, and I think, think that neither Rafał Czaskowski nor President Duda could actually project this message. All right. We had uh, a campaign where the uh, opposition candidate in the second round, the mayor of Warsaw, uh, was late to the game, as we have said. Uh, we also had a campaign where there was an endorsement for the incumbent that came just four days before the first round. Andrzej Duda becoming the first foreign leader to visit the White House since the start of the COVID-19 pandemic. U.S. President Donald Trump uh, was gushing in his praise of uh, the ruling uh, Law and Justice Party's handling of Poland. And as I've said many times, Poland is one of the few countries that are fulfilling their obligations under NATO, in particular their monetary obligations. And uh, they asked us if we would send some additional troops. Uh, they're going to pay for that. They'll be paying for the sending of additional troops and we'll probably be moving them from Germany uh, to Poland. Uh. And that's become uh, more firm uh, since that time. Uh, Dominika Kozic, that endorsement from Donald Trump, did it help candidate Duda? I think that maybe a little bit uh, yes, because Polish people usually used to, to like America for us. It was always this country who was delivering, delivering us uh, a help when it was necessary. So. It was a strong message from Washington, then Poland. It is uh, this main alliance of the uh, U.S. Uh, now inside the European Union after the Brexit, because uh, without UK inside EU, it is Poland who is the biggest uh, friend of the uh, U.S. inside the EU. So I think that for some of the people, it was quite a uh, strong uh, message of support. And the other question, it is, uh, which is even more important, it is question of security. I mentioned that it was the second uh, issue in this campaign, it was security. Now, you, all of you know what is uh, now the situation uh, on the eastern borders of Poland, especially, I mean, about Russia, about a recent statement of President Putin, very, very worrying. And uh, now we need real American uh, military presence in Europe, especially in Poland and Baltic states. So that's why for many pe uh, Polish people, this message came from Washington, was a very clear and very strong message uh, that uh, we will still have this uh, privileged position inside the NATO and we will have this uh, bigger American presence in Poland. All right, not every poll is a fan of that endorsement from Donald Trump. Um, again, the former prime minister uh, who is now the president of the European Council, Donald Tusk, on July the 2nd, putting out a tweet where he says, I've always believed in the Republican ideals and greatness of America as an anti-communist from solidarity. Polish prime minister and EU president, Reagan was my hero, and I got to know Donald Trump really well. These are the reasons why I pray for Joe Biden's success. Uh, Bartholomew Wroblewski, your, your reaction when you saw that tweet? Well, uh, I'm not sure if this uh, tweet was very clever. Uh, America is important for Europe, for our security, and Poland, independently, uh, who was uh, ruling in Poland since 1989, uh, has been trying to convince our Western allies that we should keep uh, the relations with America as good as possible and we think, I think, it's still important and uh, um, I'm not a fan of, uh, of uh, um, 
uh, of such statements which uh, uh, which don't build this relation uh, which put it in question uh, as Donald Tusk uh, did it so uh, so I was a bit uh, disappointed that he formulated such a remark I think unfortunately it was uh, strongly uh, connected with the election in Poland so it damaged Europe interests let uh, me ask, let me ask. particular because of particular interest of Donald Tusk party Stanley Bill is that the right assessment and uh, what does that tweet and the reaction to it say about Poland's place in NATO in the European Union I, I don't think really that there was very much that came out of this meeting, uh, either with respect to this election or with respect to uh, Europe's place in NATO or the European Union. I mean, this was uh, clearly a campaign stunt from Duda's point of view. Trump's motivations uh, is something I know less about, but it would appear to have been a swipe against Angela Merkel uh, on the one hand. He's making his point about NATO defence contributions and possibly even the fact that there are Polish voters in important parts of important swing states um, that he might want to get on board for his November campaign. He may no longer be the president after November. Uh, we, we don't know that. So I really wouldn't think that this incident is going to be remembered for very long. And where does Poland stand today inside of the European Union? Are those questions of uh, rule of law we talked about at the outset uh, going? Are, is Poland going to be pressed on it is my question. Well, I mean, it, cert it certainly looks like it. Those are the signs now that there is a desire to link uh, European funding or the European budget um, to rule of law. Um, where, but where we've heard, if I may, we've heard that before when it comes to Hungary and then, yeah. well, yeah. not much happens, does it? I mean, there are many reasons why that may well not, not happen. And there are, there are many obstacles to that. Um, it seems actually the most effective break on what the Polish government has been doing with rule of law has been the European Court of Justice. The European Court of Justice rulings has genuine, have genuinely halted some of uh, PiS's reforms. Nevertheless, we, we have seen erosion of uh, judicial independence, and it will be interesting to see now whether, as has been signalled at various times before, but again, there's no guarantee that there will be follow through, whether we see uh, a continuation of those reforms, a radicalization of those reforms, whether there's an appetite for greater confrontation with Europe, perhaps even with the European Court of Justice. And that, that's a complex issue. Um, but I think it's very uncertain how that's going to go. But there's certainly going to be a continuation of this rhetorical conflict, at the very least, between Brussels and Warsaw. Marcin Zaborowski, it's going to just sort of continue at a slow simmer that uh, tension between Warsaw and Brussels? Yes, well, I think so. I mean, I, I think that during the first, uh, you know, term of this, this government in office and uh, and, uh, and Duda's term in office, uh, there was a conflict and the EU, uh, the Commission thought that, uh, um, you know, but it had effective instruments to actually, you know, uh, influence, you know, the, uh, the uh, violation of rule of law in Poland. It didn't transpire to be the case. Uh, so the commission actually failed to meaningfully influence the, uh, the changes there. And as Stanley s said, you know, it was only the ruling of the European Court of Justice that actually had some impact. I think that the commission has drawn some lessons from that. Uh, and I think that uh, what we will see now is tying the future funding, especially in the context of the European Recovery Fund, the, any additions to the EU budget, these will be tied to the assessment of the rule of law. Uh, still, we'll need to see whether that will be comprehensive and uh, adopted in, in relation to other EU member states or, or only towards Poland and Hungary. All right, much more to talk about, unfortunately, we're out of time. I want to thank you so much, uh, Marcin, Marcin Zaborowski, for joining us. Uh, from the Polish capital, Bartolomeu Wroblewski as well. Dominika Kozic in uh, Brussels, Stanley Bill in Cambridge. We want to thank you for being with us here in the France 24 debate. Much more on our website, france24.com, as well as Facebook, Twitter, and our YouTube channel. Bye for now.